Uh, that day, do we have seats for people? Has everybody got seats? Okay. All right, so we're going to hold like a little bit longer so we can get seats for the five people who came in. And also because we're having a little moment getting live here. So this, we are live? <laughs> it's all right. I run on queer time, so like I'm used to everything being at least a few minutes late. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming tonight to Brockton Writers Series. Um, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge that we are on the lands of the Haudenosaunee Anishinaabe here on Wendat, and most recently the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Um, and we understand the ways that colonization, genocide, and racism has impacted indigenous communities, and that people who are settlers have a responsibility to examine the ways our ancestors uh, contributed to colonial legacies with like both silences and with actions and what our responsibility is right now. I mean, everybody has the responsibility to like critically examine systems of oppression and what part they play in them and what they can do to mitigate that harm and what they can do to take action. So for you, what that might look like is writing to your politicians about missing and murdered indigenous women, about boil water advisories on reserves, about what they've done to implement the recommendations of the TRC. You can support financially indigenous causes. I'm assuming everybody here is a big reader. So you could buy the books of indigenous authors, um, consume indigenous journalism. Um, and you know, my own personal perspective is that like we could do a lot by uncrowning some crown land. And we also like to acknowledge that Black Lives Matter. Um, this is a discrimination-free space. We uh, do not tolerate any 2SLGBTQ discrimination, because I can look at where we are, that would be absurd. Uh, <laughs> um, we do not tolerate Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, ableism, any of these. Um, would not be tolerated here. And we have a mandate to uh, program marginalized voices, voices like that in our series. Um, and so we hope that that is what you'll see tonight going forward throughout you know, our annual cycle every year. Um, and I wasn't looking at my script at all, so I don't know if I forgot anything important. <laughs> Um, thank you very much to those of us who are here in person and to those of us, those of you who are joining us online. Uh, our format is a guest speaker who's going to talk, and then we're going to do a Q&A with the guest speaker, and then we do our four readers, and then there's a group Q&A for the four readers. So if you are online, please type your questions into the chat as they come to you, because there is a bit of a lag. Um, and if you are in person, Remember those questions, and we will get to them at the question of time. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to my co-host, Ellen. Hello, everyone. So, yes, thank you, Dory. All right. This is on. So, Brockton Writer Series, just a little bit of background, was founded in November 2009. So, that means we've been active in the Toronto literary scene for over a decade, which is very cool. Our nimble Brockton volunteers tonight are Jen Albert. Uh, we also have Nancy Clark, Dorian Emerton, Fei Dong, and I am Aileen Crowley. So thank you all for coming here and supporting us as we do our little work. If you're interested in joining this excellent team of volunteers and to get some volunteer experience yourself and working with great writers that we get to see all the time, you can check in with us after the readings. We would love to hear from you and we would love to have some more help. We would also like to acknowledge with deep thanks the continued support of the Ontario Arts Council who make this series possible. And finally, our sincere thanks to all of you who are here in person and online, and we're so glad to have you. 
So now we're going to go on to our guest speaker for tonight. So today we have Madeline Ashby, who is a consulting futurist and science fiction writer based in Toronto. She is the author of the Machine Dynasty series, Company Town, and contributor to How to Future, Leading and Sensemaking in an Age of Hyperchange. Her work has appeared in Boing Boing, Slate, MIT Technology Review, Wired, The Atlantic, and elsewhere. Welcome, Madeline. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, I also want to say again, thank you to all of the Brockton volunteers for putting up with my incommunicado-ness. Incommunicado um, uh, I have a like, um, I have a book cover coming out tomorrow, and I am in the depths of line edits for that book right now. So I'm a little scattered. And if I seem scattered, that is why. Um, so uh, this is, I settled this year on this for my bio. When everybody abandoned Twitter, or like when people began to abandon Twitter, I've mostly abandoned Twitter. Um, uh, and I settled on this for my bio because it was the thing that I realized that I do actually for my work in all of the things that I do and everything that I do and everything and every conversation that I have and every workshop that I facilitate and every talk that I give and every uh, short story that I write and every science fiction prototype that I write, uh, this is what I end up doing. I end up writing futures. So that was sort of, that became like a mission statement of a kind, I guess. Like it sort of was the easiest remit to fill. Uh, can I have the virtual slide? Uh, sorry, one more. So these are some of the things that I've written fictionally. Like these are some of my fiction pieces. Um, some of those are novels and a lot of these are short stories. So uh, I have written oh, a lot of short stories for sort of optimistic SF anthologies, even though I don't necessarily think of myself as an optimistic person. We'll get into that later. Like uh, the best story about that that I have. The other thing I was gonna say, the other title for this talk was sort of stories about storytelling, and it was going to be sort of, you know, war stories of, of how people commission me and how well or not it turns out. Um, but my favorite of these stories uh, now is still one of the ones from early in my career in an anthology called Hieroglyph, uh, which was edited by Catherine Kramer and Ed Finn over at ASU, Arizona State University Center for Science and the Imagination. It was inspired by uh, Neil Stevenson's sort of pre de for, you know, big object fiction. He wanted fiction about space elevators again. He wanted jetpacks. He wanted sort of optimistic, optimistic big projects that people could latch onto um, that would sort of be generation defining in their image. And he, his word for this was a hieroglyph, a thing that you could sort of pin your hopes on, an image that you could pin your hopes on. Um, and so, ASU did this anthology on it. And they got a lot of great people. And Catherine Kramer called me up one day and said, like, hey, can you participate in this? And I said, sure. Uh, can I write about the future of abortion rights in Arizona? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, yes, you can. And I said, that's great. Are you sure that you want me to do that? And <laughs> she said, yes, I do. And I said, are you sure you're, you're talking to the right person? Catherine, because I'm honored, but are you sure? And, and she said, yes, it takes salt to taste the sweet, was how she described it to me, uh, or something, something like that, or it takes salt to leaven uh, anything. And, that, and she's like, I need, she said to me, I need you to balance this out. Um, and I said, job done, <laughs> let's go. And then wrote about the future of abortion rights in, uh, in Arizona. Uh, one element of that story is about um, migrants to immigrants to the United States using old uh, drug tunnels into Mexico from their brand spanking new housing, smart home housing development uh, to get meso, to get mesoprofistone and, and uh, abortion drugs through. Um, and I did not enjoy being right about that. That's not a great feeling. A lot of people ask science fiction writers, oh, does it feel good when you're, do you, like, 
are you, is it validating when you're right about this? What is it like when you're right about this? And it's like, no, it doesn't feel good. It isn't validating. It's not great. It doesn't feel awesome. You want to be wrong. Um, and so the, all the stories that I write are sort of me hoping that I'm wrong in a lot of ways. Um, and so those include some stories that I've written for the World Health Organization, uh, the Institute for the Future, Sci Futures, X Prize, uh, and others. I do a lot of work for corporate clients, governmental clients, and others um, to write possible futures for them within a very limited context where they sort of come to me and say like, hey, we're looking at the next 10 years in this demographic, what do you think? Given these technologies and this problem, given X and Y, what does E look like? And I write a short story about it. And we go back and forth and sometimes I get to go introduce it and other times I never see it again. Uh, early in my career, there was a really fun moment for a client where I wrote a short story for them, actually a suite of short stories for them. And they went, they, they did illustrations and put it, they printed it out and it was very beautiful and everything like that. And they took it to where they were going to present it. And they did a presentation about one of these uh, or about all of these. And they sort of, there was a slideshow and there was, you know, there was somebody doing this job and da da da. And then at the back of the room, someone stood up and said, this is wrong. She's totally wrong about this. And, uh, and I'm gonna come back tomorrow with a counter presentation as to why. And that actually to me is one of my proudest moments um, because I really, can I have the Hannibal slide actually? <laughs> I love that she knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, no, one more. Uh, one more. Oh, there. right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hannibal, Hannibal always gets it done. Um, it's model executive function. Okay. Uh, the like because to me that is the purpose of these types of stories, and I think that's the purpose of all art, whether we're talking about um, something that I write for a client that's really bespoke or something that I'm writing commercially or something that's just for edification, uh, like fanfic or something like that. Like this is an object that exists between us, right? The art is, an ob is something that exists between us and through it, we relate to one another. We have a conversation. It becomes an object that exists outside that isn't about uh, me being right or wrong or you being right or wrong or Jim from accounting being right or wrong, or the new CEO having the right or wrong vision for the company or what have you. It exists in this sort of like little box. And we get to talk about the contents of the little box rather than not just how we feel about it, but all of the other valences that can go into it. It becomes a thing that we can, the, the art of the story come, becomes a thing that we can evaluate distant from our own, possibly distant, hopefully distant from our own biases, but also not attached to our previous history in the same way, right? Um, and I think that's the, uh, that's one of the values of, of these things because I can go back one more, one more. No, one more, two more. The beginning? Uh, uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Like, I never mastered like the clicker thing either. So it's like, honestly, this is better. Um, uh, because I think to work in futures, you have to tell people things that they don't wish to hear a lot um, or things that they might not be familiar with. A lot of really good futures work happens at, because we have observed what is going on at the margins. Um, and my favorite example of that is the fact that uh, in 1989, when Paris is Burning came out, very few people in middle America knew about Vogue culture or ball culture or drag culture. Now they can watch 10 different versions of it on cable. <laughs> That's in my lifetime. That's my lifetime. 
And that's huge, that's enormous. And, but it came because one person like sort of, you know, marched in and there are issues with that documentary um, that I'm aware of, but the, but it came up, it came from, it, and it's evidence of the fact that whatever is at the margin always drifts to the center, eventually, if it's of any merit or strong as a trend. So in a lot of the trend watching work that I do, or a lot of the trend forca forecasting work that I do is about spotting like sort of what's at the edges and what might come in, you know? Um, and that's good and bad. You, uh, the joke that a lot of futures people like to tell is about the guy who's looking for his keys in the, under the streetlights. And when someone pauses and, st and stops and says like, what are you doing? Well, I'm looking for my keys. And, you know, oh, why are you, you know, why have you not found them yet? And he's like, well, they must be under one of these streetlights. That's where the light is. And that a lot of our job is looking in the places, the darkness is at the edges of those lights or the, the places where you are in fact very likely to find the keys and some other things too. Um, so that's one of the so one of the things about the job, and that's why it's really useful sometimes to present your findings or talk about the things that you found in your study or your research or in that search for those keys um, in the form of a story. All sort of, what is it? All sorrows can be born if they are told in the form of a story. Which is actually from. I think it's a Didion quote, but it's but it's in Hannibal. Um, so yeah, it always just goes back to that, sorry. Um, and that's in part because actually, yes. Another thing that I wrote, I wrote about this this year for the Royal Society of Arts. And uh, in it, uh, I was, I, I sort of, I, I latched onto this, but also this year I wrote the introduction to, uh, the introduction to a book by G.K. Chesterton and uh, I don't know why I'm blanking on it because I'm very stressed out. Um, but uh, but the, in this book, it takes place in the future, and the and in that in the research for that forward, I landed on the actual original tragedy plus time equals comedy because that again, like I think, is really relevant to how we think about when we write about the future. That in the moment when it is happening, it is extremely traumatic. And, any, and, and I think a lot of trauma survivors know this, that in the moment it is, it is that, it is traumatic. And then somehow over time, you can laugh about it really bitterly later. Um, because time is that, not healer, but perspective, more experience. And that is sort of what we also end up writing about or writing with. Those are the eyes that we try to write with when we write about the future, because you are talking about something that might be a very traumatic and dramatic change for a lot of people, but you have to write it as though it's already occurred or is occurring. And you have to present it almost with the jaded eyes of a person who has been there for decades. And that's a little bit fuzzy to work with sometimes um, because, and in the same piece, uh, uh, I mentioned the fact that Octavia Butler, who got basically the entire future right in uh, like she, her track record is like, she bets a thousand. Like she is so on point. She is like, you know, we were talking earlier about like, what is it like when you're right? She was always right, um, eerily so. Scarily so, um, and in Parable of the Sower and uh, a couple of her other books. And what she said after she, I believe this was after she won the MacArthur Genius Grant. Um, and suddenly everybody was like, so science fiction, that's a thing. Um, she, she said, all I did was look around at the problems we're ignoring now and give them about 30 years to grow into full-fledged disasters. And, and so that is, can in fact be the formula. 
Um, and imagining those things can be, again, like kind of rough. And in that, uh, it is very useful sometimes to have rules, to have some rules or to do some setup or something like that. Where's the next slide, what does it say? Um, like for example, a plot. Can I have the, the next one? So when I was writing this, I didn't like, it had never occurred to me literally. And I felt really like I was an English major. I was a history major. I went to a Jesuit university. I was in the honors program. And somehow it had never occurred to me that a plot is a defined area designated for a certain purpose. And that is also true of scenarios or the scenarios that we write in a foresight context. Sometimes the plot is a secret plan. And that is also true of scenarios. And sometimes a plot is where things get buried which is also true of scenarios. I had like done scenario development and writing for like more than 10 years now. I've been a freelance foresight ever since 2011 when I graduated from the uh, strategic foresight and innovation program at OCADU. And it had not occurred to me that plot, plot and plot can mean those many different things. Um, obviously the math one didn't really occur to me because, come on. Um, no, go ahead. In the types of stories that I write, you do kind of have to think about how you're gonna, you know, fit this body into that box. You have to, the, the, the sort of analogy that I used to make was like, it's like trying to pack a kit bag for a trip and you don't know where you're going. You have to pack your entire life into a bag. You have to like <coughs> run and leave. Filling a short story is like with the required elements. So who is who are we talking about in the future? How far ahead in the future are we talking about? Where do, where do those people live? What are the technologies that they're working with? Uh, and who are those people? And what is their experience? What has their experience of this future past been? Uh, is like furnishing a tiny home with everything you need to live. The shorter the story, the less available space there is. And packing an entire uh, future into 500 words is like cramming an entire life into a tiny rabbit hutch. Um, I recognize that complaining of this in Toronto is probably not actually the most, I'm sure you actually do know how exactly to do this and, and so on. But some of the people that I talk to are like, <gasps> especially when you tell them about square footage here, like they're just like, how do you live? And I'm like, with healthcare. Um, um, but it can also like lead to being simplistic. And that is something that I've had to really reckon with this year in particular. Um, this was the year, This the other thing I was going to talk about that here was that, you know, it was sort of, here were some of the lessons that I'd learned in storytelling over, over 2023, like a, what I did on, on my summer vacation, except it wasn't a vacation that involved a lot of calling people um, <laughs> for interviews and so on. Um, but that simplistic nature of some of those stories is actually sometimes what gets the message across in a way that I didn't want to acknowledge when I was starting out. Um, so recently you may have heard the facts or heard the, the story that President Biden uh, recently watched um, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. You know, at that age I wouldn't spend three hours on that movie. But, but apparently, having watched it, you know, he came out with this verve to take on artificial intelligence. He suddenly wanted to deal with the labor implications of artificial intelligence and, the, and so on and so forth. So like suddenly this executive order was about to come out, which, you know, Dead Reckoning, as far as I can tell, is sort of a re-workshopped dial of destiny treatment. Uh, they're basically the same plot. There's an older man and a younger woman in a train chase for three hours. <laughs> but no, think about it. He also fights a motorcycle off a cliff. He's also, he also does that. But, uh, but every 20 minutes in Dead Reckoning, they exposit the threat. 
and they exposit it in the simplest possible language. They explain AI again and again and again, and again, every 20 minutes for three hours. And that may in fact be what it takes, which really sucks for like people who really enjoy subtlety and nuance. <laughs> or naturalistic dialogue. <laughs> but it got the job done. And that I think is the thing that I've learned the most this year from, I wrote a bunch of pieces for Wired this year. I'm editing this book this year. I've written a bunch of stuff for my clients this year. And the thing that I really wish that I had known is the thing that I learned over the course of this year is the thing I wish I had taken to heart earlier or the thing that I really wish I had understood earlier in my career is one, you have to explain everything. And two, you have to, uh, you, sh you have to meet people where they live. Like for me, the craftsmanship on the story can be Nipplu Ultra, but if they don't get it, then I haven't done my job. And that is where sometimes like things get simplistic. And in fact, it can be very useful, which is why to go back to this dystopia's question, um, you know, a lot of writers, especially science fiction writers get asked like, why are there so many dystopias? And then we say, they sell. And, and we, we like being paid. Um, and, and, and then there's like, no, but really, why is society obsessed with these, these dystopias? Or like, why are, why are there so many of them? And the thing that I uh, have kind of landed on is that dystopias are really easy to write because history has done all of your homework for you. <laughs> Uh, before I was a futurist, I was trained as an historian. I thought I was going to be a history PhD. That's sort of what I was trained to do. I was trained, uh, I did a departmental honors thesis in Holocaust history and um, in enforced prostitution and sex work. I did, uh, and then I did an English departmental honors thesis on science fiction. So I've sort of been here, there, and everywhere. But in those, in studying that way, what I realized was that, you know, history has done all that work for you. Someone else has done all that work for you. It's all there to pick from. It's all there to grab. Um, it really is same Jack Boot, different day. Um, so it's easy. And the audience knows what it is. Uh, can I go next? One? On the flip side though, and this is a thing that you learn working for corporate interests sometimes, utopias are really individual. Your friends cannot agree on a restaurant. Now ask them to agree on a future, right? Um, utopias are individual. They communicate ideals shaped by culture, time, and experience, which is different for all of us, right? That is the story of our life. The story of our life is not the same. It may share certain uh, commonalities. There might be some universal experiences that we all share, usually bad ones, um, actually loss, things like that. Um, but the, uh, but the, the utopia, when we imagine an ideal state, an ideal condition, it's different. For example, a boarding school where children are spirited away to wear different clothes and learn a new language is not in fact fantasy for everybody. Uh, in someone else's utopia, I have no rights. You know, it's a very loaded term. Um, but uh, can I have the next one? What I've landed on, and what I sort of landed on, uh, and what I've sort of seen again and again in the work that I do, is that when describing a utopia, one is really pointing out places where you have been hurt. Because you're always going to address the things that you think are problems when you're describing that ideal world, right? And you're imagining quite optimistic, like you're imagining what that world will look like when those wounds are healed, right? What will it be like when those things, when we exist in a state of care and repair and stewardship and fellowship and all those things, right? What will it look like when I am, when I and we and they are mended? 
So in this way, creating optimistically requires a huge amount of vulnerability. And I think that's really the key of like why it's very difficult to get optimistic visions out of people. You're not just talking about like the triumph of, of you know, hope over experience or whatever it is that they say about second marriages or whatever, but the, 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 you're talking, but you're talking about the sort of vulnerability required to hope and the vulnerability required to describe what you want. It is really easy to talk about the things that you don't like. It is really easy to, it is super easy for me to like totally rag on dead reckoning. <laughs> if I told you what I really enjoyed about Fallout though, there would be, yeah, I would be a, lot, a great deal more nervous. If I told you what I enjoyed about Hannibal, actually, no, I wouldn't be nervous about that. But the, but if I were to tell you about like the stories that shaped me, that's way more vulnerable, right? um, because you're talking about something that you're actually that is pleasurable and hopeful and so on. And so I think like those are some of the things that I've, you know, been wondering about in the work that I do because I think it lands on this. In foresight scenarios and in uh, futuring workshops and foresight workshops and all, a lot of the stuff that I do, um, part of the scenario development is to ask a question about like, what might this future look like? What might these multiple futures look like? What does collapse look like? What does transformation look like? What is the status quo 10 years from now look like? Blah, 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 blah. But really, you're asking a question that is about like, how do we know when we've gotten to the future? What is the win condition? Uh, in, uh, in counseling and therapy, this is often pitched as a, I will know I am better when, I will know uh, a relationship has improved. I will know I am uh, less anxious. I will know that I am have better self-control when. And those are like little signposts. And in fact, those are stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. Right, which is in fact the most important story that you'll ever tell is the one about you. Um, and that I think is like what I've been thinking about recently. And I really appreciate you bearing with me through all that, uh, especially on this utterly filthy and not in a good way evening uh, in, in, you know, Toronto in November you know, God help us. <laughs> um, uh, so yes, um, I will take some questions. Answer right. questions. If so I am here. If there's Woo! Anything, give it up. For if there's anything I didn't cover in all of the rambling, I mean, maybe all the questions have been answered. I might have just been here, there, and everywhere. Utopias, dystopias, working for corporations. I know. I'm very, I know. I'm very I curious. I'm but um, huh? I'm here to run a, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, does that work? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm curious for one thing. So you mentioned how stories help convey those things, but for you as a futurist, <laughs> how did you gain that interest in looking at the future? Because you mentioned studying, <clears throat> yeah. studying the past, but I find that that jump to the future and especially in terms of a storytelling component like, was it through stories that resonated with you or was it something completely different? The, the, like, it's kind of a couple of different things. Like, that's actually a super great question. Um, and for those, uh, I guess everybody would have gotten that online. They would have heard that, correct? Um, the, I think like, there are a couple of different things. One is that I was lucky enough to grow up in a household that like consumed science fiction that we had, you know, we had science fiction books around the house. We watched a lot of science fiction. We sort of, we, so I was conversant with the idea of stories about a future generally. Um, I also uh, was raised by a dad who did, who was a regional sales rep for uh, closed circuit television systems, surveillance systems. Um, and so everything in that job was about what might happen. Um, and for some people, uh, some people get really trained, really, really well trained really early on to constantly be imagining what might happen next. 
for a lot of different reasons. And if you get really good at it, you end up doing it for the rest of your life, no matter what. Um, and then sometimes if you're very lucky, they pay you for it. Um, but in terms of when did I want to be, I had always wanted to be a writer. Uh, as a little kid, I would recite stories to myself. Like before I could write, I would do funny voices and I would rehearse them until they were perfect. Um, and now I still do that. Um, but with my hands, uh, the, so I, I had always been interested in that, but actually, uh, I went to a talk when I was working on that other departmental honors thesis, actually, I, it was when I was at Seattle University. I went and saw a talk from Ursula Le Guin when she was talking about um, the wave in the mind, her collection, The Wave in the Mind. And the Iraq war had just broken out. It was actually 20 years ago. Um, and uh, she sort of talked about, she said something like, and I used this for a long time. Uh, the exercise of the imagination is dangerous to those who profit from the way things are. Yeah. And um, and when I heard that, it was like being struck by lightning, which was also what it was like to meet her. Like she literally, her eyes were wolf blue. Like when she looked at you, you like were rooted to the spot. And she was this tiny woman and I like passed her at one point. She looked me like head in the face. And then later I had to tell her that I was write, like writing a thesis about her, you know? Um, and so that was, you know, a moment that was definitely like a personal inflection point. Um, but it was, but it landed, it was nestled in with a lot of moments that had come before it and that would come after it, right? I mean, I also, uh, another of which was um, getting into the Cecil Street Writers Workshop and being in a car with Carl Schrader, who also does this job, um, and him saying, I had just finished one master's degree and he said, so what are you doing after this? I had just gotten, I had written like for two years about Japanese animation and cyborg theory and, and culture and everyone around me was like, what is going on with you? Uh, how are you going to live? And, uh, and, 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 and Carl said, uh, so what are you gonna do with this? And I was like, I, I don't know. He's like, cause there's this program and I think you should apply for it. And I did and that was it. So it's like, you know, life is actually full of those dramatic, very narrative moments, but you know, I had support. I had support to, to, you know, and I think that's the story of a lot of writers and a lot of creators generally. It's like, I was supported in the thing that I was interested in, which I should have just said from the beginning, but you didn't need to know all that stuff. Questions? Yeah. So you were talking about how it's not it doesn't feel good when you're yeah. right about yes. what you're writing about. It's perversely validating. <laughs> um, so when you are writing about the future, do you aim to write realistically or optimistically or negatively? Like how does that um, play into Often your like that'll like be in the request. So the, the question was sort of like, are you asked to, like, do you intentionally try to write as hopefully or as not? hopefully, or what have you, as you can, like, um, often in a, in a private sort of context, it is like, let's talk about this in a hopeful way, or, or in, and in fact, like the note I often get back is like, this is very dark. One time I got a note back from a client where they had asked for a short story about self-driving cars. And, uh, this was years and years ago. And I wrote a short story, uh, you know, I figured that no one wanted the short story about like teens getting pregnant in self-driving cars. Um, Cause that would have been right. That would have been accurate, right? I mean, the history of the automobile speaks for itself. But, um, but I figured probably not. So I wrote a short story about a woman who uses an autonomous vehicle to get from like a, a big city airport to a rural town where her mother has died and she is writing the eulogy in that car. 
uh, because she doesn't believe that she's capable of driving in the moment and she has things to do, right? And there it was an assist. And I gave it to them and the client was like, this is very dark, but our client really loved it because it was again, like a moment that a lot more, that a lot of people have experienced. It landed on a moment of universality like it landed on a kind of pain or a kind of experience that more people are likely to have across a lot of strata. Your parents are going to die, no matter who you are or how much you make. Um, and and so it was a thing that I you know picked out that way. And it's, and sometimes it pays off. Other times, not so much. And I'll get a note saying like this is too dark or this is too this is too much. Uh, the other time that I. The one time though, that I got almost no notes back, like they were only grammar notes. They were only, like nothing tonally, like almost like, like the most perfect thing that I've ever gotten back was I wrote a short story called Patriotic Canadians Will Not Hoard Food uh, for an anthology published by MAT Tech Review uh, or MIT Press uh, edited by Gideon Litchfield um, about post pandemic life life in 2025 or whatever. And I wrote it in 2020. And uh, I, so I wrote about this, you know, woman whose farm gets shot up because her scarecrows still have masks on. But I hung that story on a Hallmark romance template (laughs) about, um, you know, this woman who owns this farm in small town, Ontario, and the big city lawyer who wants to buy it from from her so that he can build a school on it. And because, again, because I had hung it on a mannequin that people could recognize, right? It was on a shape, it was on a template, it was on a format, it was in a box that they knew what to do with. It was actually incredibly well received. It wasn't this, and like, that was the spoonful of sugar. That was the candy coating. And, and so it wasn't about necessarily like how the idea made them feel, it was how the story made them feel. And part of that is the format of it. And that's the thing, I guess, like I really wish I had known earlier. Or had been willing to accept earlier, maybe, I don't know. Hi. Oh, hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you so much. This has been amazing. And oh, thank you. Um, I'm just so I'm a short story writer as well. And and you're talking about um, like writing for clients. Yep. And and I just think it's so cool that you're. It's like I'm assuming it's like kind of like corporate clients. Y- yes. And I'm like, how does this happen? And how how are like corporate clients asking you to write? It just makes me feel more hopeful about the world. I, I <laughs> wouldn't go that far. Paying you to write short <laughs> stories, but maybe you're not paying you not hopeful. Oh, I wouldn't go but, that far. But like, um, yeah, like, how does this happen? And then how is it like? And how are they presenting? You're like you're writing. They're like, okay, we're gonna hire you to write short story or something. Mm-hmm. And then you're presenting, and like, how is it presented to like their client or whatever? Like, I'm so curious that, about this. So like, uh, a lot of this gets like. Now I should, I have to show my, my and my friend's book, uh, How to Future, because we talk about it there, but also that's to save you like a massively like way belabored explanation about like Herman Kahn working for Rand in the early sixties and like living in Los Angeles and making friends with a bunch of filmmakers. And they were like, hey, Herman, you know, if, you know, maybe military reg- readiness and logistics planning is like incredibly dry and you could do it a different way. Um, like, uh, so it came out of it came out of that kind of practice, and then sort of got refined at Royal Dutch Shell in the seventies, where Pierre Box sort of scenario planning like saved them as a company from the seventies oil crisis. Um, imagining which which is to say, he imagined the possibility of failure, which is usually what everyone wishes to avoid, but he imagined the possibility of failure and steered them away from it. They steered away from it after looking at what failure might look like, uh, which is a very simplistic version of that story, but is kind of what happened. Um, now, like, I can maybe, pres- like, in this context, like, I might get asked to write a short story that appears at the end of a report, 
Uh, short stories are incredibly like cheap, not just because we are cheap, but because like it isn't a film production, it isn't commissioning a lot of uh, a lot of other production. It's like fairly easy to do, um, or or not even easy to do, not easy to write, but um, but it is simpler than making a film. It is simpler than writing a comic book. It is simpler than you know doing performative dance. I don't know. like um, like it. It is simpler for that reason, and it is a thing that it is way more likely to be read. You know, um, I have some friends who uh, like August Cole and uh, Peter W. Singer who wrote, uh, what is it? Uh, Ghost Fleet and Burn In, two different novels. They had written <laughs> this and prior to publication, they shared it with some friends of theirs in the Navy. And one of their friends kind of unbeknownst to them, uh, I'm not sure if it was, I'm not sure if he told them beforehand, but basically, uh, one of their generals asked for a briefing and their friend said, actually like everything that is in that briefing, like here's the briefing, but everything that's in it is in this much cooler story. And then the entire, <laughs> and then a lot of more people read that book um, because it talked about threats, threat response, po multiple possibilities and so on in a, in a more fun way than like pie, pie charts, right? And, and so I think that that's, that's the, that's one of the utilities. Like, um, if you read, uh, uh, Walter J. Ong's, uh, orality and literacy, he gets into the idea of, uh, sort of oral storytelling and like the oral culture of ancient Greece and elsewhere, um, being a way to transmit knowledge in a really specific way, which is like why, the Iliad and the Odyssey have extremely detailed instructions for how to sacrifice an idol because they wanted the kids to know, right? The same as, you know, um, like Laura Ingalls Wilder telling you how to build a sod house or Jane M. All telling you where the clitoris is yeah. or whatever. Yeah, so we're going back in time. Clan of Cave Joe. Yep, I know my people, I know my people. Um, so like, uh, I think Ursula Le Guin calls it the carrier bag theory of fiction, where like the fiction is a unit that you pack things into. It is your duffel bag. It's your giant, what do they say in succession? Like bag of ludicrous size. It was, you know, ludicrously large or whatever. Um, so it, it is that, um, but I might never see how it's presented. I might have no idea if they read it or if they like it or whatever, or I might get feedback back. Once I got feedback in the form of like, someone sent me a beautiful bracelet. Cause I had gone to a workshop and I, and I had like, she really liked what I had to say or she liked the story and she, and, and I talked to her about writing and I was like, oh, I really like your bracelet. And she's like, oh, I'll send you one. And literally she did. It was like, it was, it was one of the moments where I was like, oh wow, like she remembered. That's really nice. You know, like that kind of thing. I'm terrible with that kind of stuff too. So I really, but um but yeah it's 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 as different as all reading is i want to say so you haven't told us how to get your job i've noticed <laughs> <laughs> i went i went to school <laughs> incur debt no uh incur debt uh uh you know um i went to i i went to and finished um the SFI program at OCADU, just down the road, um, in its first year, like in its, in you know, when the path was much rougher. Uh, so I was part of the initial cohort, in the initial graduating class of that thing. I, en I entered in 2009, graduated in 2011, and, and was working and have been working very luckily and very fortunate um, ever since and, and stuff. And alongside that, um, I, so I turned in a master's thesis and was editing a novel and moving house uh, all in the same like six month period, which I do not recommend to anyone. But it's the story that I tell to like grad students when they're like, how do I get this done? Like, you will find it in you. <laughs> if you must, you can, <laughs> like that kind of thing. Um, but there are lots of people who don't have that training who are in this job. 
And it, they came at it from, you know, technology, technology trends watching or technology consulting or message consulting or like other things that required them to look at multiple possibilities at the same time. Um, so it, it takes all sorts too, is the other thing. And that's, I think like one of the things that we wrote, one of the reasons we wrote How to Future was so that like more people could do it. Cause we consistently got asked, what is the book that I read about this? And we said like, well, you could read a doorstop from GBN that is impenetrable or here, you know, and it was designed so that you could, you know, do the exercises in or, or learn the lingo in it in, you know, C-suites and church basements, you know, that's where we wanted it to be. And, um, and so that's what I would say. And now, like I, I tell people, like, if you're interested in it and you want to spend the cost of spend, if you want to buy a book and not like an, a very expensive workshop and or degree, read this first and then see if you're still interested. <laughs> um, and if you are, then, you know, then I'm sorry, I have bitten you and now you have to pass it on to somebody else within seven days or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> anything, anything from online no okay thank you thank so you. much for thank being you. here with us that one. I think now is this time is it not the time when we pass around the picture so if you have any extra cash it burn in a hole you can put it in the picture all of the money goes to support uh independent uh writers your local writers not all of us have corporate money uh i mean i actually i have government money but anyway uh, <laughs> so we it all goes to the writers um that we program for our readers and our speakers um and if you are of the new generation and you do not actually carry cash you can also paypal us uh, I think it's, for this, I do need this. Uh, I think it's Brockton Writers at PayPal. Yes, paypal.me backslash Brockton Writers. So you can also PayPal us there. And um, so we do suggest that you do some pay what you can um, to help us pay our wonderful readers and our speakers. Also, if you are online on YouTube right now and you haven't liked and subscribed, please do. If you uh, have a phone on you or want to do it when you go home, looking at your looking us up on YouTube and like subscribing to the channel really helps with our visibility. It really helps get that channel pushed out to other people who love literature. So please like this video, subscribe to the channel, go back and watch all of our previous shows since May. No, no, May was no May. What May didn't happen? Twenty twenty. Uh, July was a trash fire. No, no, I think that was. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I feel I feel like September twenty twenty was when we really pulled it together, <laughs> and have been ever since. Thanks so much to to Jen especially for that. And now we are going to move on to our readers. We have a plan. Paula in the house, right? Yes, yes, yes. I didn't get a chance to say hi. Um, but uh, Paula Ferrante is the author of Her Body Among Animals from Book Hug Press. Her poetry collection, What to Wear When Surviving a Lion Attack, was shortlisted for the Gerald Lampert Memorial Prize. She has won Grain Magazine's Poetry Contest, the New Quarterly's Short Fiction Award, Room's Fiction Contest, and has been long listed for the Journey Prize. Thank you. Thank you all for being here on a super gross November night in Toronto. And Madeline, I can't see you right now, but if you're still here, there you are. Thank you for um, actually describing one of my utopias, which is where a short story writer gets paid. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to read from Her Body Among Animals, which does have some science fiction in it, but I'm going to read more of a uh, fairy tale and ghost inspired story today. Um, this is from the story Mermaid Girls, and in this story, funhouse mirrors can show your deepest, 
darkest desires. And girls are indeed at risk of growing mermaid tails, especially if they lurk in nefarious Mr. Marvelous at his aquatic emporium of undersea adventures and are then said to disappear or maybe haunt the lake, who knows? Um, the narrator in this story is a 12 year old girl named Emma. And she's feeling kind of abandoned because her astronomer mother left them and her father left them and her older sister Dee has a boyfriend and she is now involved sort of with her her next door neighbor Roger who is a nerdy mollusk loving guy. My hand and for a second he leans in closer to me and I think this is it. I'm going to kiss him. I think I want to kiss him. And I'm trying to figure out how to adjust the course of my mouth to his mouth while correcting for the gravity of my stupid nose in order to prevent an unceremonious crash into his faint upper lip hair when I see something in the lake behind him. I tell myself it's probably just a plastic bag floating through the leaves. And it could just be the wind from any direction causing standing waves on the lake, or maybe even the tidal pull of the moon. Even though it's moaning now, I tell myself firmly that it's just an iris, like what they thought the Apollo 11 astronauts were experiencing when they heard their, when they heard that ethereal wailing. Whatever it is, flipping around up there in the water, it's not a mermaid. And it's definitely not a ghost. What star are you looking at now? Roger asks irritably. I'm not. Roger likes to explain that, unlike dumb beetles or baby sea turtles, mollusks don't orient by the light of the stars. I've seen a mermaid once before. It was a lot like seeing a ghost. It was after mom left, the day Dee and I crouched on the stairs to the basement where mom used to sleep way into the afternoons on the couch wedged between the still packed boxes labeled kitchen and baby stuff. We listened to dad yelling on speaker home. How could she have kept him in the dark like this? Mom said he should have known. She used to be a girl alone in the dark, staring up at celestial bodies in the night sky until she ended up staring into the pools of our father's eyes, blue like the lake, with the sky reflected in it. Then, like the lake, it was hard to breathe. It's not like you can breathe in outer space either, our father screamed. Hadn't she wanted a house and a family? Dad said this was everything she said she wanted. How could she say their marriage felt like a black hole? I tried to picture mom leaving with Dr. Robert, but I couldn't. Even light disappears in a black hole. Just come home, Dad pleaded over and over. Don't you want to come home for the girls? Mom had taken her clothes, her telescope, her binoculars, her sextant, her star charts, and all the work she had done with Dr. Robert on the need for isolation training to populate Mars. She would kissed us and told me to make sure Dee didn't get into too much trouble. Even though Dee at 11 was three years older than me, Mom said that sometimes she made less sense than the ridiculous upside down position beside her Cassiopeia in when we banished her to the sky. But Mom left her plans here. Its date and time were set to October 23rd, 5.39 p.m. Standard time, minus one hour for daylight savings, when the next solar eclipse could be seen in the Northern Hemisphere. It was a message to assure, clear as any almanac. She'll come back, Dee kept saying. I know she'll come back for us. Dee had a plan. No way was Mom going to miss the eclipse. And if she was staying at Grandma's, she'd watch it from the same spot she always took us to on the lake. If she saw us about to stare directly into the sun, you bet she was going to come do something about it. The time Dee, Mom, and I were going to see our first partial solar eclipse, my sister and I got into a fight about who got to stand next to Mom and tore apart our paper plate viewers minutes beforehand. Mom had to tie our scars around our eyes so we weren't tempted to look up, then hustle us back to the car. When we got home, Dad said he didn't understand what the big deal was. At least we didn't go blind. But Mom was screaming. Oh, of course, you're right. Of course, it's nothing. There'll be another one visible from this hemisphere in, oh, another 20 years or so. Her face had crumpled. You're right, David. It happens all the time. Who I am is being eclipsed all the goddamn time. The afternoon of the eclipse, Dee and I snuck out of the house, leaving behind the new pinhole projectors Mom helped us build out of old Cheerio boxes on one of those rare afternoons she was in isolation training with Dr. Robert in the study, or doing a pretty good impression of a slow zero drive from your space shuttle to the couch and back. It was freezing by the lake in October. I stood there, feeling about as warm as astronaut pee when it hits the vacuum of space. And I yeah. thought, this is it. Come on, Mom. Come and save us. You have to want to save us. 
She's coming, right? You said shiver. Of course she is. She just can't see us yet. It was me who decided we should go farther out, to the highest point of the lake visible from shore, the island at the center. I knew the water was cold, but I figured we could still make it in time for the peak of the eclipse, since it was a fairly short swim. I slipped into the water, but de dove. Mom, who never really knew how to swim, used to warn us about not diving in head first. You have no idea what's in the water. For a long minute, Dee stayed underwater. Come on, Pepe. Come on. When Dee finally surfaced, she looked dazed. We made it about halfway to the island, but by that time, my sister was almost blue, and I tried to do the huddle position. 101 astronomy tips and jokes for girls definitely haven't covered that in their tips for a solar eclipse. It's a lot harder to wrap your arms around each other's backs and intertwine your legs than you can and feel your own toes. Then I saw Mom. She was wearing a long skirt, and as she waded into the water from the island toward us, it twisted and tugged, getting tighter and tighter until the skirt was her skin, and then her skin was scales. Knee deep in the sunset water, her fishtail glistened like an otherworldly thing, reflecting a perfect Roy G. Biv rainbow. She made a wild animal sound, wading deeper, thigh deep, waist deep, past her shoulders, getting slower and slower as her fishtail dragged her toward the bottom. By the time she grabbed us, she was disappearing below the surface. I dimly remember thinking I had done this. She was trapped, and I was going to drown us all, and I started to cry. Look up, she screamed, keep her head above the water. All I could think of was how, when mom first started walking with Doc, working with Dr. Robert, I had gone into the study when I wasn't supposed to, taking a bunch of papers and a pair of scissors off her desk, intent on creating a family of mermaid paper dolls, a mermom, merdad, and two mer daughters, all covered in shells and scales. When she had found me, she'd slap me across the face. Then she started crying herself, saying, I'm sorry, I'm a bad mother. This isn't me. I didn't want to do this. But somehow, she dragged us to shore. In the morning, she was gone. Again, there was a wet, empty skirt on the kitchen floor, as though in the middle of the night, our mother had shut that skirt. I want my sister to tell me I'm wrong about what I saw at the lake. I want her to tell me it's impossible. I don't want her to go to the lake tonight. But her eyes light up like Sirius against the early evening sky as she sits cross-legged on her bed. The mirror is now playing a dream involving a handsomely tattooed pirate and sloshing a piece of gold over and over until it elongates into a woman. Emma, I love him. Of course I'm going to the lake tonight. Maybe you just saw the ghost. Who knows? Maybe I'll see her too. I don't understand why my sister wants to think the ghost is real, but why she'd want to see her. When I glance at the mirror, it switches scenes to a tropical underwater landscape from the perspective of a piece of gold buried alive in a treasure chest. But Desiree doesn't know this. D, what does the sun say to the moon? I don't think you understand the gravity of the situation. <laughs> what does the planet Venus say when she falls in love? D counters, dramatically opening her bottle of nail polish and turning the radio on to some cheesy pop station. I groan, all the songs are love songs. I don't know. Roger and I haven't even kissed yet. I'm over the moon, she says dreamily, only half painting her big toenail. Um, he's so marvelous. We had the most magical evening last night. Love, the radio informs us, is a battlefield or a curse or a disease without any cure. I'm not sure if it's love, but my sister has a pimply rash starting on her calves. And in the dim light, I can't tell if her toes are just swim wrinkled or actually slightly wet. Was there always that slight fluff of skin between her little toe and the rest? Was that what love did to you? I try to remember my sister's feet and sandals. I wonder if her pseudo fingers are just another part of how my sister is changing. The kind of change that makes Dee wear bras that remind me of Roger's models of shelves. The kind that makes her care about boys, but not meteor showers. The kind grandma keeps threatening that I'm going to go through soon, too. All right, thank you so much, Paula. Also, just wanted to say you have a great speaking voice because the microphone was not even on that whole time. <laughs> but oh, wow. we could really hear you, so well done. <laughs> That's my teacher voice. <laughs> Incredible. All right, so our next reader is also here in person tonight. We have Jeffrey Luscombe. 
Called one of LGBT fiction's brightest new stars by the Huffington Post, Jeffrey was born and raised in Hamilton, Ontario, and is the author of two books of literary fiction, Shirts and Skins, and To Refrain from Embracing. Jeffrey has also contributed articles, interviews, opinions, and essays to newspapers and magazines, including The Globe and Mail. Everyone, please welcome Jeffrey. <laughs> Is that right? That's good. That's good. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for having me. uh, First time here, which is exciting. Not my first time here. I come here all the time. I had my uh, book launch here uh, a few weeks ago, so it's nice to be back. Um, Yeah, I have uh, two books. uh, Both of them set in the East End of Hamilton. Um, Shirts and Skins and my new one to refrain from embracing. The Hamilton Spectator uh, last week uh, called my work naturalistic broke ass realism, uh, <laughs> which I dig, and I'm going to put that on the next book. Um, this uh, I'm just about uh, I'm st- from the beginning of chapter two of the new book to refrain from embracing. Uh, here we go. Gloria hated wearing her work clothes downtown in her black slacks a pink short-sleeved polyester blouse and clunky clunky black work shoes. She sat alone on a seat near the front of the King Street bus, staring out the window and hoping she wouldn't run into anyone she knew. The kerchief she tied around her head during her shift at Monroe Monroe Steel, along with her dinner, a chicken loaf sandwich, was in the black leather purse she had set beside her on the orange, orange vinyl seat. The purse was covering the words, fuck you, that someone had written on the seat in blue ballpoint pen, more boldly than they needed to, in Gloria's opinion. (laughs) She looked down and checked the time on her silver-plated wristwatch. It was past 11.30. She gently bit her bottom lip. Gloria was on the swing shift all week and had to be up at the hospital by noon or she risked being late for a 3 p.m. shift back in the east end of the city. She yawned and, trying to conceal it, covered her mouth with the back of her hand. It was already a long day, and she wouldn't get home until close to midnight. The bus came to a stop outside Diamond Jim's nightclub. Diamond Jim's was in a block of downtown buildings on King Street that included pawn shops, arcades, and the sorts of bars that Hamilton's less affluent alcoholics convened outside every morning, waiting for the doors to open so they could fill up on $1 draft beer. Diamond Jim's was certainly past its prime when the likes of Vic Damone and Frankie Lane had sung there. Still, at night, its enormous red sign, sporting man in a tuxedo and top hat holding a cane with a huge glowing diamond on the tip, still shone brighter than any of the electric lights lighting up downtown Hamilton. In the middle of the day, with its faded and chipping red and gold paint, an old and odd missing bulb, the Diamond Jim sign just looked absurd. Gloria sighed. It must have been at least a decade since she'd been inside. And both Jim and I are looking a little worse for wear. Gloria had once seen the platters at Diamond Jim's. She tried to remember what year that had been, but the truth was they hadn't been the actual platters at all since most of the original members had left the group by that time, by the time they had rolled into Hamilton. There had been, Gloria recalled, only one authentic platter left among four fakes. Still, they had sung The Great Pretender, one of Gloria's favorite songs, almost as well as on their old records. I looked pretty good that night, Gloria thought, as the bus continued down King Street. That night she had worn her brown fox fur, the one she had bought at Modern Furs after saving up every extra dime she possibly could for over a year. It wasn't the best fur, but that night, with her black hair up and in a pale pink dress that made her light brown skin look like she had just returned from a holiday in Miami Beach, She looked darn good walking down under that blazing sign into Diamond Gems. That very well could have been, she thought, with some sadness. The last time I looked really, I looked good, really good. Maybe the best I ever looked. Better than I'll ever look again. Her fox coat was long gone. It had been hawked along with Ted's Kodak camera in a last desk in a last ditch and utterly futile attempt to save the first house. She had tried to save up enough money to buy another fox coat, but then 
What had happened? Oh, well, Gloria thought no sense crying about an old coat now. And no one could ever take away that night at Diamond Gems with the platters. The bus passed a variety store with a busted 7-Up sign where six teenage boys stood in a semicircle smoking cigarettes and laughing. Gloria in instinctively slipped her hand into the strap of her purse. She never felt comfortable downtown among the bands of teenagers outside record stores and drunks in Gore Park and the eerie old buildings from the turn of the century that ran along King Street. The bus rattled past the pagoda, the pagoda Chop Suey House and the Chicken Roost Restaurant and turned onto James Street before stopping at Hunter Street, where a stream of kids in their late teens and early 20s, probably off to Iroquois College on the mountain, noisily filed in the door, filling up most of the empty seats in the back of the bus. Gloria admired the easy way the girls chatted these days. They were all hair and teeth and dressed so nicely in bright colors. Skirts, she noticed, had gotten longer again. Many skirts had gone out of style because women my age started wearing them, she thought. A few years back, Gloria's sister Doris had had a purple mini skirt that to Gloria's mind was far too young for her. Young girls like that probably took, looked at, Gloria's and, at Doris and older women in these clothes and said, count me out. And that was the end of the mini skirt. I should say this is set in 1977, <laughs> the summer of 1977. Across the aisle from Gloria, sat a boy and girl holding hands. The boy, with a good-humored face and shiny full lips, wore a dark blue t-shirt, jeans, and a denim jacket. He had the same sandy-colored hair as Ted, uh, Gloria thought, but this boy's hair was feathered back over his ears the way the kids were wearing it these days. The girl beside him wore, wore a red blazer, white, white blouse, and tight blue jeans with fancy stitching up the legs. Her hair, blown out at the sides, was too platinum blonde not to be bleached, not to be bleached. But Gloria still admired how it bounced with each pothole the bus hit. That was one thing Gloria had never tried, bleaching or coloring her black hair, even though a few strands of grays had begun popping up. The girl with the bouncy hair leaned close to the boy and rested her head on his shoulder. That girl looked so pretty, Gloria thought. They all did. But everyone looks like a beauty when they're 19. They just don't appreciate it. I looked pretty at 19 too, even though I had two kids at the time. The boy put his arm around the girl and kissed the top of her head. Together they sat that way with their eyes closed as the bus began its ascent up Hamilton Mountain. Gloria turned, turned and resting her chin on her hand, looked out the window. She had lived in Hamilton all her life, but was still rather unfamiliar with the mountain. East End folks like her and Ted stayed on their side of the city for the most part. Oh, sure, there was the occasional trip downtown to Eaton's or Kresge's to shop or to visit a nightclub, like Diamond Gyms, but that was it. The last time she had been up on the mountain before Ted had gotten sick was when she was in the Henderson Maternity Hospital a decade earlier when she had Josh. Everything Gloria wanted was in the lower city. Gloria looked at the weeds and wildflowers growing along the foot of the mountain. Every time she made this trip up to see Ted, she thought how Years ago, her mother would take an old wicker basket and hike along the base of the mountain in search of gold, of gold thread, a healing plant, her mother called it. As a little girl, Gloria's mother had learned to use gold thread from her own mother at the Net Lake uh, Native Reserve in northern Minnesota, where she'd been born and raised. Whenever Gloria or her siblings had stomach trouble, her mother would brew a strong tea from its leaves and long yellow roots and have them drink it as she rubbed their bellies and sang old Indian songs to them. The tea tasted terrible, but always made Gloria feel better. As she grew older, Gloria would brush off her mother's old native remedies, embarrassed by them, just like the native songs and words that her mother would use. Now Gloria wondered if any of those plants growing along the mountain road might be gold thread. She had no idea what the plant looked like in the wild, and her mother was long gone. If she could do it all again, she would have paid closer attention to those sorts of things. She would have learned one of her mother's native songs to sing to her own children, or would have written down some of the native words, now long forgotten, that her mother had used. Who would have thought that words could be so easily lost? The bus turned and twisted on the road up the mountain as she watched the jagged limestone wall a few feet from the window. It wasn't even a real mountain at all. 
The Niagara Escarpment was just stone chiseled out by receding ice thousands of years ago. Or well, that's what Gloria had been told in school. She briefly wondered what this would look like a thousand years from now. Maybe it would be covered in ice again. Once Gloria had wanted to be a nurse. Her mother had told her she'd, been, she'd be a good one, considering how well she looked after her younger siblings. But Gloria had only made it to grade 10. In those days, it cost money to go to high school. The textbooks cost money. Then there was a close. They cost money too. Unlike these Iroquois college girls who probably had a different expensive outfit for every day of the month, Gloria only had one nice plaid skirt and white blouse. Every day she would wear a different colored scarf or trade sweat set sweaters with doors to make it look as if she had several outfits. And after school, she would wash out the same skirt and blouse as gently as she could. She found she was fooling, she thought she was fooling them until one day as she sat in English class, a note flew over her shoulder onto her desk. She slowly opened the note and, and read, why do you always wear the same clothes? Gloria quit school that same day. <clears throat> After that, she knew her future would be spent in one of the many factories around Hamilton. And that had seemed all right with her at the time. There wasn't much choice really. Without an education, it was either a factory, clean houses like her mother did, or marrying someone who made enough money that she didn't have to work, which didn't happen too often to the girls in the East End. Lovely day, isn't it, said an elderly woman as she sat down slowly in front of Gloria. <clears throat> yes, it is, Gloria replied, smiling, as she reached up and pulled the cord ringing the bell. The next stop was a Hamilton psychiatric hospital. So many young people on the bus this time of day, the elderly woman said, sounding annoyed. This section of the bus must be reserved for older ladies like us, eh? Gloria chuckled to herself, old ladies like us. As the bus slowed and stopped in front of the hospital, Gloria smiled, picked up her purse off the orange seat, stood up, exposing the bolt. Fuck you. Yes, Gloria says, smiling. I suppose it is. I know. I know we've got some Hamiltonians in the house tonight who might have <laughs> recognized. Is, is it? It's Haligonians if you're from Halifax. So if you're from Hamilton, it's Hamiltonian. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Jeffrey's yeah. yeah, that's right. Hamiltonian. <laughs> um, so up night next, we have one of our virtual readers. Oh, oh. I feel like this inception <laughs> they moment. Turn their camera on. It's yet? me, okay. and then it's me, and then it's me. <laughs> I don't need that many of myself. Um, I'm already like a whole lot, just one of them. Uh, so up next, we have Shalene Knight, the author of four books. She is currently working on com a commissioned book on Black self-love and joy, forthcoming with HarperCollins Canada in 2023. Shalene is the founder of Breathing Space Creative Literary Studio. Welcome from BC. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. And just to double check, can you hear me? Because you never know. Is the audio working? Maybe if you want to give me. Yeah, awesome. Perfect. Well, thank you folks so much. It's been so awesome hanging out here and just listening to everyone share. It's been really great. So I'm happy to be here. And I'm going to read from my novel, Junie, which recently won the Vancouver Book Award. And I'm so excited about that. So I'll tell you a little bit about my book, and then I'll read a very short excerpt. So Junie is set against the backdrop of Vancouver's Hogan's Alley in the 1930s. And in my novel, Junie, we explore the intricate relationships among the neighborhood's women. So Junie is a young Black girl burdened by her mother Maddie's abuse and neglect. Initially, she forms a painful trauma bond, believing herself to be the cause. However, through art and strong role models, Junie embarks on a transformative journey of self-discovery, learning to maintain distance from her mother's control while loving her from a distance. So Maddie, once tough and unyielding due to her industry's demands, spirals into despair and she turns to alcohol with no recovery in sight. And so Junie's realization that she can't save her mother parallels the neighborhood's decline, marking a pivotal moment in her growth. So I'm gonna read about five vignettes 
And these five vignettes are told through Junie's point of view. And what they do is they give you a very clear picture of how she feels and how she sees her mother, Maddie. I sit across from my mother, my arms folded gingerly in my lap. We sit together, but apart at our small kitchen table, eating each other's silence around a plate of toast and two half full glasses of powdered milk, the edges crusted with white. A sliver of sunlight shoulders its way into the room through the sheer curtains that hang above the large double sink. The cadenced sound of the slow dripping water from the faucet pools in a greasy salad bowl. I listen as the water rises. How can so many droplets fill the dips and valleys like that? How long does it take for each tiny drop of water to build a community in a small bowl? I focus on the sound. It hammers through my ears in time with the thunderous pressure in my chest. I search the table for the buried jam, jam that has disappeared just as quickly as Mama's wages. Mama's eyes clutch mine. Eat your toast, little girl. Mama wraps her lips around a cigarette, then exhales a fog of smoke that hovers above the bread like a rain cloud. I help cinch a thin tea rose stretchy garment with a thousand mini eye hooks around Mama's broad waist and the lower half of her body. A lit cigarette flaps between her lips as she grunts, cries, stretches, and pleads with the fabric. The veins in her neck stand guard. Come on, Junie, now pull the other end. Mama stands in front of her vanity, the room dismal. Me, on my knees, I fasten the first three eye hooks as Mama takes another inhalation and then quickly secure the other teeth-like hooks in between. I feel hot ash land on my head. I brush it away without a word and stand up. I step back and look at Mama. It's eating her. The skin around her waist is pulled in so tightly, but I can't stop my imagination from spinning. I picture the flesh folding over itself like an unplayed accordion, a squeeze box. I see all the air in Mama's body vibrating, flying up into her throat and back down to her toes, her torso a concave hollow shell. Why would anyone want to suck the sound out of themselves like this? Mama's storytelling takes hold after she's had a few fingers of gin. Now I know the signs. Mama's eyes lower, her lips crease. Then the stories rush. Tales of her looking down on those who don't live like she lives, who don't spend all their dollars buying the best fruit spreads, tinned salmon and lard for skillet frying their chicken. Mama wants to have what others don't have, just so she can say she has it. The world needs to pay attention to Mama and give her all the money she deserves because she is a star after all. This is what she tells me, and I don't know how to swallow her words down. They scrape the insides of my throat as they go. Mama turns her nose up at anyone who doesn't worship her or at least agree with her. She talks about the men who spoon themselves around her body most evenings when she steps off the stage. She tells me how their strong arms keep her warm at night, but when the golden halo of the morning tiptoes in through the curtains, she sends them running home. She, tell, she, tells them, she tells me how she tosses their worn shoes at them in disgust. Everyone wants a piece of Maddie Lancaster, she says. The more the stories fly from Mama's mouth, the more I retreat into myself like the folded accordion skin held back by a thousand teeth-like eye hooks. At breakfast, I see two nickels on the table to erase the stories she can't remember telling. Mama, the two-syllable word is tasteless in my mouth. As it slides across my tongue, it clings to the roof of my mouth, just like that off-brand oat sludge I eat some mornings. 
flavorless, gray, just something I need to stay alive. I sit up in my bed, pull back the sheet, and creep down the steps to the small kitchen. I stand in the doorway, and the cracked wooden frame holds me there. I watch Mama at the stove as she stirs and hums some unnameable tune, her apron strings swaying in time with her hips, her back turned, the white straps of her nightie hugging her shoulders and clinging to her back like freshly made spaghetti. The pointy blades of her shoulders jut out, then in, perfect undulation with the swoosh of the contents in the pot. Mama has one hand wrapped tightly around a cracked wooden spoon. The other firmly grips a slender cigarette. Its ashes grow like an unsteady tower of dishes in the sink after a long Sunday dinner. The red line around the tip of the cigarette shifts from red to orange to gray. The tower of ash weakens and breaks off in slow motion, then lands in the pot. Mama never stops stirring. I sit down next to my mother and tell her all my biggest dreams. My eyes swell into full moons. I tell her how I have a best friend and a teacher who sees the gold in me. My back straightens. Mama smiles, blinks the tears from her eyes, and they pool in the corners of her red painted mouth. We are out at a cafe sharing a plate of fries, and Billie Holiday blares from the jukebox. Mama lets me have all the big fries and pushes them to my side of the plate. She closes her eyes and hums the tune, and I get lost in the melodic weight of her voice. I am in a trance as she sings. When we step outside, two girls on bikes zip by and almost trample our feet. A man with a dirty apron around his waist chases them down, shaking his fist at them. I wonder what they did, or what he thinks they did. The girls on bikes disappear into the distance. Mama wraps her, eye, her arms around me and pulls me close. She leans in and kisses me on the cheek. The sky's stars fall into my lap. I wake with a jolt. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shailene. That was really beautiful. We're going to welcome our last reader tonight. Also joining us online, we have David Demchuk. His novels include Red X, The Bone Mother, and with debut author Kareen Lee Clark, The Butcher's Daughter. He has been nominated for the Scotiabank Giller Prize, the Amazon First Novel Award, the Aurora, the Shirley Jackson Award, and the Cobbsar Award. And tonight he joins us from St. John's, Newfoundland. Everyone welcome David. Hello, everyone. I trust that you can hear me. I am huge. <laughs> I want this screen to be with me everywhere I go. <laughs> oh, and look, there you all are. It's lovely to see you. Um, all right. Uh, thank you, uh, Brockton Writers. And uh, thank you, uh, everyone who's read so far. It's been fantastic. Uh, special hello to uh, Paola and to uh, Madeline. Um, I was honored earlier this year to be approached by the editors of Embroidered Worlds, a soon to be published anthology of fantastic fiction from Ukraine and the diaspora. I selected three pieces from my book, The Bone Mother. This is one of those pieces in memory of my father's brother. It is titled Nikolai. It's a kind of a bedtime story and it is just right for a night like this. I do not remember this. I cannot say what is true. A year after she and my father married, my mother lost her first child and was told there would be no other. This was hard, as you can imagine, and my mother told my father to go and find another wife who could bear him a boy. My father loved my mother and remained, but their dead son was a shadow between them that even strangers could see. 
the story she tells. One day, just as winter was turning to spring, my father was helping a neighbor repair his barn while my mother stayed home sewing. She heard a cry from the forest behind the farmhouse, and rather than wait for him to return, she went out to see what it was. Just beyond the line of trees, still in sight of the house, she found me, lying in the fresh fallen snow, a baby, naked and shivering and close to death. No footprints anywhere. I had white hair and pale eyes. She thought I was her first son's ghost. She named me after him, nursed me as if she had borne me, and when no one came to claim me, she and my father made me their own. But there were wolves in those woods, sometimes heard but seldom seen. They howled but did not come near. One evening, my father was out back with me near the berry bushes. He looked up and saw a pack of dark hunched figures with glittering eyes watching from within the trees. He bundled me up, startling me into tears, and he hurried me into the house. He had a gun, his father's hunting rifle, but he had never killed with it, and my mother had never touched it. He took it down from the back closet shelf, stepped out the door and raised it. The dark figures and their shining eyes were already gone. A few mornings later, my mother awoke to feel a cool breeze curling around her toes, the scent of fresh grasses filling the bedroom. She looked out into the hall to see the back door into the kitchen was open, sunlight bursting into the house. She gasped, jumped from the bed, checked my crib. I was gone. She screamed, waking my father, and pulling her clothes around herself, she ran into the sunshine, blinded, shouting and crying into the forest. She stopped just where the leaves cast their shade on the ground, and she stood, and she looked, and she listened. And my father stopped and stood beside her, holding the rifle. It was quiet and still, quiet as no forest should be. We will need help to search, he whispered. We will need 10, maybe 15 men. No, she hissed, I will not leave. We must find him now. She looked to the right where a small rise was crowned with a trio of beech trees. She moved slowly towards it while my father watched, then stopped, listened again. A high light whine and then gentle panting. She motioned for my father to come in closer. Then she carefully crept to the source of the sound. In a den on the other side of the rise, a white wolf was nestled on a pile of rags, nursing her young. Three tiny white pups and me, the warm wolf milk smeared around my hungry mouth. My father raised the gun and my mother stopped him. No, she said. And as the words spilled from her mouth, three other wolves emerged from among the trees. He lowered the barrel and he and she moved backward slowly as the animals stared intently. Once out of the forest, my father turned and asked, what will we do? We will wait, my mother said, I will wait. They will not harm him or they would already have done so. Then she turned to my father and said, she saw my face and I saw hers. They are animals, he spat, our son, is he also an animal? We are all animals, she said. I will wait. The next evening, my mother was in the kitchen making supper, talking to my father in the other room when she realized she was alone. He had slipped out the door behind her. Suddenly, she heard one shot and then another. She rushed out to see him stagger out of the woods and fall to the ground. She screamed and ran to him. His face and neck had been mauled, and he shuddered furiously, the blood coursing out of him and then slowing to a trickle. The convulsion slowed and stopped. He was dead. A howl tore through the forest behind her. She turned and ran to the den to find a woman who was not a woman, a woman with long white hair and eight teats shot in the shoulder, her pups bewildered and mewling around her and around me. She saw my mother and pulled the rags over herself, which my mother saw were her blouse and skirt. My mother went to her, knelt with her, tore her own skirt to clean and dress the wound. She fed the pups warmed goat milk. She went and fetched water and food as the three wolves watched and wailed. She stayed through the night with the woman, came back with me day after day until one day the den was empty. 
The wolves had moved on. I do not remember. I cannot say what is true. But I do know this. When my mother died many years later, I knelt beside the bed and cried. And the wolves in the woods, they cried along with me. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. That was amazing. We are now going to have a Q&A with all of our readers who are here today, both online and in person. So if you're here in person, please come up, Jeffrey and Paula. And for those of you who are here uh, attending as audience members in person, start to get those questions brewing. If you're tuning in online, please provide your questions in the comments or in the chat. If you do have a question, type it in. There might be a bit of a delay, so we just want to make sure that we can get to you. Also, please note that we will only be reading questions that are respectful of our authors and of their work and that don't promote any sort of oppression. So please, everyone, welcome our authors for the Q&A portion. Is it on? Yes. Okay, great. Great. Uh, do we have any questions online? No? Okay. Questions from the house? Anyone? We've got our online people. We've got our at here people. We've got wolf suckling and mermaids and neglectful mothers and Hamilton. There's a lot going on here. Okay, I'll start. Um, what do I want to ask? What? 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 I mean, yeah, I've always, always got things to ask. Um, what I'm thinking about, I guess, is a sense of place. Like, like for Jeffrey, it's like very Hamilton. And it's like, if you've been to Hamilton, you can imagine those places. But David, it's like, there's a forest. And there's a forest. And there's a den in the forest. And with Junie, or the house, it's like, it's, it, you can picture the house that it is in, even if you've, I mean, I don't, I don't really know Vancouver that well, but like, I really felt like, even, even just the description of the like cigarette ash falling into the pot of food, I'm like, oh, I know what kitchen that happens in. I've seen that happen. <laughs> and then the beach with the island, yeah. So if we could talk maybe about, if you, each of you could talk a little bit about like how you situate your stories in a place and describe that place and have that place be a living, thriving thing. Who wants to start? Well, I have a mic now, so I guess I'll start. <laughs> I think this is why you get this to me. Um, so... The, the setting in Mermaid Girls um, is sort of this weird lake community, um, but because I write speculative fiction, the settings are always so much more than just a lake. <laughs> um, in Mermaid Girls, I envision this entire sort of empire of this, this like sort of charlatan guy, Mr. Marvelous, who's got this crazy aquatic underseas adventure empire going on and it's this, this entertainment place that has funhouse mirrors and all sorts of magic happening and there's like nightly mermaid shows this is in like an earlier part of the story so that all is in decay now and it's sort of like remnants and, and like ghosts of that era sort of spilling over into the lake and spilling over into um what like the whole idea of what it means to be a girl and a woman in this sort of restrictive society where you, you can turn into a mermaid and lose yourself completely. So for me, place is really about um, envisioning the elements that are kind of acting as a metaphor for me to actually talk about what's going on in the story and the interior lives of the characters, like the funhouse mirror, which is pretty obvious because it does show your deepest, darkest desires. <laughs> Uh, I write about Hamilton. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, actually, it's it's Hamilton, but it's not Hamilton. Um, I, I write fiction, and I didn't want to write an autobiography. So many of the streets are, 
in Hamilton. And if you read it and you know Hamilton, you'll say, well, where, where is this park? Where is this street? Because they're not, it, you'll, if you, that bus actually went backwards and hit a street, because it's, it, it's, it's not, it's not, I didn't want it to be a biography. But the great thing about Hamilton is that really Hamilton has this like notorious past. It, it's, it's a character onto itself. I don't know if I could write that way about Toronto. I've lived here 20 years and I don't know if I could make Toronto a character like I can easily do with Hamilton as this sort of, you know, this, with this crazy, notorious, shady past. And, and so I, Hamilton is just like, it's, it's a major character in the story. Um, and uh, so, so that's, that's the way that I write it. It's just like, it's, it, it lives and breathes as part of it in, in realism, that sort of thing. David? Hello. Um, so I, I really need, when I'm writing A Sense of Place, I need to have things that are quite particularized. And a lot of times, the level of detail that I need in order to, to, to situate a story, um, a lot of it ends up falling away, but it was useful for me as part of the process. Um, with Red X, uh, which came out in 2021, I did write about Toronto and I wrote about Toronto in very specific, particular ways from 1984 really until I think it was what, 2016 or something like that. And it was very important for me to immerse myself in each of those periods, really to remind myself of what was happening at each point so that I could create that reality for the reader. But at the same time, I'm aware of the fact, particularly working in, in speculative fiction, particularly working in, in fantasy, in, in, in horror, in, in folklore, things like that, the entirety of the place that I'm creating is within myself. And what I'm doing is I'm manifesting um, a place that I'm creating within myself within kind of, you know, a real life sort of framework or matrix so that, so that people will be able to approach uh, what it is I'm writing and, and where I'm going through, through something that they feel tangibly, that they recognize intimately, and that, that gives them sort of a feeling of trust in the story that I'm creating. The most recent um, book uh, that I've written with Corinne Lee Clark is, is set in Victorian London. I've been to London. I've been to parts of London that absolutely have survived from well before the Victorian era, but I needed her help. We worked together to create that sense of place because she had lived there longer. She knew the place more intimately and we were able to make a London that was our own. And I think that's, and the same is true with uh, the Eastern European stories in uh, The Bone Mother. It is that sort of coming to a halfway point between making something that's really real, but also making something that is that is a conduit for your imagination. Sydney? Yeah, yeah, I, I love this question. For me, place is essential uh, in anything that I write. And for my novel, Junie, I thought about place as character and place as voice. And so this idea of trying to bring back a neighborhood that was displaced, but to do that through the eyes of the character. So in my book, I really wanted to highlight not just the history of Hogan's Alley, so this small neighborhood that was a, a Black and immigrant neighborhood. So not just to highlight the history of that neighborhood, but to shed a light on the living that took place there. So, you know, the relationships between uh, these people, the sense of community, and to really highlight that. And I think for me, sense of place is also it, it feels like it's it's almost automatic and I think because of a lot of the authors that I read so thinking about uh, Catherine Hernandez and, and David Cherry Andy writing about Scarborough and just the way that sense of place became almost like a suffocating character but in a good way and really just wanting to emulate uh, that style so I think sense of place is, is huge and you know there's so many different fun things that you can do, especially when you you look at how the characters can engage with their setting. What does that look like and feel like? And so things can become super visceral in that way. And I took this more poetic uh, style for my novel to really highlight a lot of that. So big fan of, of place in novels. Great question. Thank you. Questions. 
David, I want you to know that someone tonight asked me to sign your book for you. <laughs> so I signed well, it. Well, that was very thoughtful. <laughs> um, I have a question for, I think, all of you. And the question is about safety and safety in uh, reality, safety in fantasy. Uh, it applies to Junie, the character, in terms of her need to withdraw into a fantasy world where she feels her own powers, like superpowers she has that she's able to connect to. And I think, you know, there's um, in her body among animals, there's a sense of safety, um, I think, attached to um, in, into trans morphication and trans yes thank you um i i'm not sure what the term is but um but there's uh but my question is really about safety and uh and uh and fantasy and reality i like this i'm gonna i'm gonna jump in if that's okay i think this is a, a fabulous yeah. yeah a fabulous uh question because i think safety for me especially in writing this book it had it came in so many different shapes and forms and layers but for me, I was inspired by something a writer friend of mine said, uh, Taya Mutanji, and she said, writing a book or writing in general can be a second chance at something. And so for me, this idea of safety becomes an opportunity for me to give my character maybe this sense of safety that I may have wanted for myself. So it's this, this idea, again, calling in these characters and allowing them to take some of the load and to bury or carry some of the weight that we've been carrying as writers. So I, I took this idea of safety in a, in a multi-dimensional way, but for me, it was very personal, this lens of safety. So yeah, interesting question. Got me thinking for sure. Um, I will go. I think there's there's sort of two ways that I see safety operating in her body among animals. And one is, as you've mentioned, that the characters often go and undergo some kind of metamorphosis or try not to undergo a metamorphosis to maintain safety. So in, in there's another story in this collection called Cobwebs, where um, a woman who is sort of not really sure she wants to be in her marriage anymore. She's an artist and her husband wants kids and they met when they were in art school and she turns into a spider because, you know, as you do <laughs> when you're tired of your marriage. Um, so there's a sense of safety for her in being able to get out of her own body and take on this, this form that is like kind of appalling to her husband because he's scared of spiders. Um, and then in Mermaid Girls itself, there is a safety of not transforming into this mermaid of not having this constricted uh, body that is only meant to swim and not and you can't run away and you know you're this this siren this object of desire um, but the other way that safety I think plays into the stories in this collection is it, it gave me a way to talk about really hard stories so there's stories in here about domestic abuse there's stories about postpartum anxiety there's stories about living with depression and dropping out of grad school because of it which I did um, and being able to talk about that, you know, like if the abusive partner becomes a dragon, if postpartum anxiety becomes a poltergeist, if depression becomes an albatross literally around someone's neck, um, I think it's easier somehow for the reader to stay with the truth of that story because they're sort of invested in the world building and the, the oddness of the situation, the defamiliarization. And so there's a, a way of providing the reader some safety in, in, in seeing these truths in a way that they might stay with you versus complete realist fiction where they might shy away from that truth. So that, that's my take on safety. <laughs> I don't think anyone in my novel is safe. Um, it's, it's, it, it, everyone has, uh, is very vulnerable and they don't have financial stability. They don't have um, uh, real health. Um, it, it's set in 77, like I said, and there's a, a young boy in there who's, you know, who's growing up kind of feral with parents who are working all the time. And he is traumatized in the book. Um, and I can't make it less, more safe for him than, than what I saw and what my own lived experience in Hamilton in the seventies, which was, which was hard, which was very feral, which was very ugly, which was very, very dangerous and without getting a lot of, of help from adults. And so 
that that's sort of where where I am, and I know I have heard, and I and I tell people, I people say, Do you, are you going to give me a trigger warning? Not the part I read, but is, is there, and I said, there's many, there's there's many in there, um, and I, I've been told that someone had put it aside for a little while um, because because it, it because it was making them feel unsafe um, with, with some of what was going on. So that's just I, I write to to the truth that I remember that that I saw in my own lived experience. And I, I honest to God, couldn't write any other way because that's sort of how I view life. And it's certainly how I saw it back then is that we're, we're all so vulnerable. And, you know, it's these small connections with people um, that kind of make us feel less vulnerable. And, and that's really these small connections uh, in my book um, that make it less less or more bearable uh, David so uh, hi um, so I, I I'm going to spoil uh, Red X a little um, there's a point in the book where one of the characters messages me on Facebook to ask what she should do about a particular situation and um, and I you know, and I, I give her some, some pointers, some suggestions of directions she should go in to research a particular creature that she has encountered, she and her friends and, and really the entire queer community uh, for decades. And, uh, and at one point, you know, closing the conversation, I tell her that I wish her a better ending than I would write for her. And, um, and to her credit, she got a better ending than, <laughs> than I had been considering. Um, I think, I think it's hard in, a, I mostly write, I mean, people will put different words to it, but I mostly write horror and I'm fairly, um, unabashed about that. And that intrinsically creates a relationship between you and the reader where the reader is looking for a dangerous experience and a reader is expecting that you're going to put beloved characters in danger, um, that you may knock some of them off and, um, and that it's going to be a struggle for both of you. And, and you have to, you know, I think if you're going to succeed in working in this genre, you're going to have to enter into that relationship respectfully. And at the same time, not be afraid to, to play with people's expectations, including expectations you've created yourself around who's going to be safe, who's going to be in danger, what's going to... Um, imperil people and what that and what surviving that imperilment is going to is going to mean for uh, both for the characters you've created, but also for for you as the writer and for the reader. I I, tr I treat the concept of safety of the reader very seriously, and I also treat their expectations seriously, even if I in some cases want to subvert those expectations. Um, but I try to send very clear signals when I'm when I'm writing, and I try to create an atmosphere when I'm writing when people where people can trust me. Even though there was in the Bone Mother, there was one there was one section um, that I remember quite well, where a character, a couple of characters actually in the book, um, are narrating stories where they die, and then they just keep narrating, <laughs> and uh, and it's because to me. Um, there's the twist of that, but there's also the the compulsion to tell the story, to complete the narrative that your death has truncated. And I think that's um, that's a really challenging and interesting dynamic. And it and it flies in the face of oh, the person who's telling a story in first person is is going to make it out alive at the end. Well, not necessarily so. Um, I think I think that's an an interesting dynamic to play with but uh but yeah safety is uppermost in my mind in my work absolutely and kind of has to be thank you so much everybody do we have any last you look like you have something to say no okay uh, we'll probably move on to our, our, our rocked and special final question then. Uh, I do invite everybody to hang out for a bit afterwards, have a drink. Do you two have books that you brought to sell? I do. Do you? Yeah. So you can hang out, have a drink. 
schmooze with the authors, buy their books. For the people online, you'll have to go online to buy their books. I'm sure they're available in multiple places, including, you know, the Evil Empire, Amazon, or other places, or on the blog. You can find links to where to buy their books on our blog. Yes, our website is a one-stop shop. Okay, so our final question that we always ask everybody, pick one, one, Book that you've read recently that you would recommend everybody read. This is so easy because David Dumtok's actually here. <laughs> and um, he's my horror hero. And if you haven't read Red X, go and read it. It is horror, literary fiction, incredibly vulnerable, personal narrative. I, it's amazing. I'm not just saying that because you're here. And I'm not just saying that because you bought my book. It's an amazing <laughs> book. Go read it. <laughs> Uh, I not not everyone's favorite, but uh, Jonathan Franzen. Uh, I, I know, I knew, I knew that was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I I reread the I reread the corruptions, and I did. I know. David. Well, I would. I would not have blurbed Paola's book if I hadn't loved it. So, uh, because I'm just built that way. But um, I also would really like to recommend Andrew Sullivan's The Marigold, which I think has been one of the great books of the year. And uh, and another tremendous portrait of Toronto in decay um, in so many ways. And the people who are struggling to survive within it. Well, and also... Something that's not really a person, and uh, and so I, I I recommend it very highly. I think it's a, a tremendous book. Such a difficult question. I'm going to recommend Rachel Murthy's River Meets the Sea out with House of Anansi. Beautiful, beautiful book. I would say as close to Toni Morrison as I've ever read. So that's a yes, beautiful writing. Rachel Murthy's River Meets the Sea. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I did not know that, like, David had blurred Paola when I booked them for the same evening. Just, you know, this is not a conspiracy. Total coincidence. Um, so thank you, everybody. Uh, next rocking is January 10th, 2024. We'll be back here at Glad Day and online, and you'll hear readings from Phoebe Barton, Camille hernandez Remdoir. Mich uh, Michael Marola and Shikoi Hibbert. And as always, we'll bring in an industry professional to teach us something new about the craft or business of writing. Wait, you probably know who that is. Um, it's Robin Schrodinger, the mystery writer. The Toronto mystery writer, Bobby Rodenberg. Oh, mystery, that's awesome. That's gonna be so fun. So please come back here January 10th.